Hi there, uh, I'm uh, Faisal Islam. I'm the BBC's economics editor. Thank you to the many thousands of people who are joining in this very important topic uh, of the Jobs Reset Summit, the new vision for social protection. We have an excellent panel uh, and I'm your moderator. I feel like I've been a moderator of sorts during these extraordinary health and economic times, trying to moderate between people's lived experience in this extraordinary situation that we go and film as the BBC and what's actually happening. We're finding that actually going out and seeing people and filming them, you often get better, more uh, up-to-date information than the data. And you're seeing huge innovations in terms of public policy, huge reactions in real time, and also learnings from other parts of the world and other countries that we haven't seen before. Uh, this is a time to take stock, but also to think about this moment, whether it's a time to sort of relaunch a different type of, uh, of protection system going into the future. As I said, we have a stunningly brilliant panel. Um, and uh, I think without further ado, let's just get into, into that. Uh, I think I'll, I'll introduce them as we go. And we'll start with the, uh, we're lucky to have the Federal Minister uh, for, um, uh, and Special Assistant to the Prime Minister of Pakistan on poverty alleviation and social protection, and that is uh, uh, Sanya Nishtar. So, Sanya, if you just uh, help us, uh, you know, how, given everything that's happened this year, how can national social protection systems in emerging markets uh, be redesigned for this uh, new normal? Well, first of all, thank you for having me on your um, uh, on, on this uh, program, and thank you for convening this very important conversation. I think. Uh, we, we need to think of social protection as a right now. And governments have to uh, be very clear that we need to massively expand social protection and make it very responsive in, uh, you know, in a post-COVID context because the need is so immense. I mean, the loss of livelihoods have been so decimating um, you know, in countries like mine as a result of uh, COVID that we will really need to draw social protection uh, de novo. And as I said, uh, look at social protection as a right. As governments do that, I think that there are certain important pillars on, uh, on, which, to, on which to construct uh, a sound multi-sector strategy, a good data backbone, adequate funding, you know, appropriate digital infrastructure, uh, making sure that the right principles is what we draw on, and then, of course, accountability for delivery. So I just want to quickly outline to you what we have done here in Pakistan, because we're in a bit of a fortunate position, because Pakistan started off with a very expanded social protection and poverty alleviation strategy pre-COVID. So we started back in March, 20, uh, March 2019, where after a series of deliberations, we came up with a whole of government multi-sectoral poverty reduction and social protection plan with 140 elements and actions. Uh, and all of these were linked by theory of change. So there was a completely new strategy with different programs that were mutually reinforcing, targeted at poor women, orphans, the homeless, poor laborers, farmers, the disabled, widows, uh, individuals who are at the risk of catastrophic health expenditure. You know, there were interventions for primary school going children for uh, for, for students, there were livelihood promoting programs for the uh, for the extreme poor, and there were also nutrition interventions for, for from a human capital uh, perspective. A number of different conditional cash transfers. So once we had the strategy in place, the government uh, committed funding, you know, indigenous funding, not donor driven, and we made investments in the new socio national socioeconomic registry, and not just a household survey but also the, the necessary investments to make sure that the data analytics architecture is there, which would immigration data, uh, land ownership data, telephone data, uh, the government employment data, and so on and so forth. So that was the, the second bit that we did, the data part. And then we made sure that our registry is not just a one-time exercise, it becomes a live registry. So, so in addition to the strategy, the data piece is this, was the second pillar. Thirdly, we invested um, resources to uh, develop the digital architecture. So we did the procurement of a new biometric payment system. We developed a SMS 
seeking request, um, uh, SMS based request seeking mechanism, which then allowed us to deliver uh, emergency cash to half the country's population. Um, uh, and, and then in terms of the principles, we made sure that uh, it was a whole of government approach that we were adopting, that the private sector was an equal partner, that technology was very much the mainstay, and that we were using um, tools such as financial inclusion and, the, and the, um, you know, to enrich whatever we were doing. The focus was very much on women and particularly on girls, and we have now very explicit uh, very explicit incentives for girls to be prioritized in uh, in the new social protection framework. Um, and in addition to all that, we made sure that accountability for delivery and delivery with integrity uh, is one of the cornerstones. So we um, got cabinet approval for a governance and integrity policy, made it absolutely binding on all the executing agencies to, to follow it, uh, we established a delivery unit, started tracking metrics, uh, and lastly, uh, information. Because during my uh, experience um, giving cash to half my country's population, the most important tool um, th that I found was information. So it was not just investments in digital infrastructure and data and the strategy formulation and the delivery architecture and the principles on which all these things were founded, but the information. Citizens must hear the truth from governments, the unvarnished truth, and they must have the confidence that governments are there to deliver for you, uh, that they have clean hands, and they have every intention to be uh, very truthful for you, uh, with you. So I think in order to espouse uh, and in order to follow that um, policy principle of social protection as a right, you know, just to wind down what I had to say, uh, governments have to, of course, legislate and formulate policy, but in order to execute it, uh, there is an institutional architecture you have to build. And on top of that, the right information, truth, is what will really do the trick. Oh. Well, Minister, th thank you very much for that. And uh, obviously, I think I'll share all our participants in saying uh, get well soon uh, on all that. Um, quite remarkable to think of a, a system that distributes cash to a sort of 100 million people in, in Pakistan and, and, and we'll develop that conversation. We're now going to move on, though, to uh, Jean uh, Zaino, uh, all, all the way in uh, the USA, uh, talking specifically, I think, area of expertise here, um, is that he is the executive chairman and founder of MBO Partners and specialises in the area of freelance workers, big, really important, underserved in some of the uh, developed country um, uh, schemes. Uh, let's see what Gene has to say about these millions of independent workers that have been hit particularly hard by the disruption, what needs to change to better support them in the aftermath of COVID and beyond. Gene. Thank you, Faso. And... Um... Thanks for uh, including me on this panel and with uh, all these you know, great, great speakers. And, and it's a very important issue. Um, so specifically regarding the independent workforce, um, which goes by other names like the gig economy and gig workers and independent contractors. Um, uh, you know, our, our, uh, my personal expertise and passion has been um, understanding this workforce over uh, the last 20 years uh, at MBO Partners. And we, we um, today uh, and over the, you know, the last um, certainly 10 years or so, we've been studying this uh, workforce with a, um, um, a report that's been fairly well recognized. It's called the State of Independence in America. And it, it's uh, surveyed um, by an independent research firm over the last 10 years, the, the growth, the behaviors, the attitudes and the motivations of people doing this type of work. And uh, in fact, we're, we're about to release our 10th year data. So it's interesting to look at the trends over the last 10 years. So, um, so what, I, what I would offer here in my perspective with regard to this segment of the workforce, which, which is a significant segment uh, and, and growing around the world, um, I, I would say there's two things that uh, we need to think about as we reset and as we enter into this new post-COVID world. Um, 
One is independent work is highly desirable by many people. And that's not only from our research, but from all the reports that are out there, some that might be uh, more self-serving than others, but uh, even the most recent uh, United States Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, when when you survey the people doing this work, they they they're happy doing it. They actually feel more in control of their world and their life. And and people are in either independent workers or traditional employees. They tend to do this work at different stages in their career. And I think that's important. It's important for retraining and skilling, reskilling and um, and and filling gaps between uh, traditional work. And even in this COVID situation that we're currently in, I think it's actually been uh, one source of trying to uh, fill some of the uh, financial needs by by doing some type of app-based work. So, so, so the, the, the first thing I would offer is that we need to recognize that this is a significant part of the workforce and it's a desirable way for many people to work. Um, and and uh, it's usually about 70 to 75% of the people that feel that way. There are certainly people that that don't want to be doing this type of work and they're forced into it, which leads me to my second point. I think the second point is we need more clarity into understanding the classification of the type of workers. It's very, I believe it's very dangerous for us to consider one broad stroke of a solution. There are, you know, as, as the world becomes more technology driven, uh, more diverse, um, more segmented, there are different work arrangements that require different apparatus and different policies and different enablements to make it work uh, well. And in our study, what we've learned is that um, there are there are what we call occasional independent workers or gig workers, and um, they tend to supplement full time traditional work during the weekends, moonlighting, in between um, uh, work to supplement income. Um, and then there are, uh, on the other extreme, people that um, at different points in their career uh, are, are looking to actually work differently on a, on a full-time basis as building their own independent, what we would call a micro-business. And these micro-businesses uh, need infrastructure, um, they they need liquidity in the market, and a lot of that is um, a, a result of um, innovation, uh, technology, things like we're doing right now through through Zoom and collaboration, and um, you know uh, the the delivery of of services is much more digital today. So working from anywhere, in fact, one of the recent aspects of a study that we just released is digital nomads. Uh, in 2018, uh, in the United States, there were 7 million of these people that consider themselves digital nomads where they would relocate at least three times during the year. Uh, as recently as July and August of this year, we, we uh, did the study again, and that number has now grown to almost 11 million. Um, so people are realizing they could work from anywhere. They could deliver their work remotely. And this is more of, a, of, of an experience for them that we, we want to make sure that we don't um, disable by having uh, rules and regulations that are overly complex by trying to protect people that do need the protection. So, um, you know, my second point here is, you know, let's make sure we don't have a one size fits all. So in summary, um, you know, independent work is very desirable for many people. And we need to think about what are the different um, structures that are needed to enable the different types of work arrangements and, um, and making sure that we both enable the people that, that want to do this type of work, as well as protect the people that need the protections. And that's not an easy problem to solve. Uh, we've been working with some of the policymakers here in the United States. Uh, I certainly have done work with the um, uh, World Economic Forum, which have released last year uh, a charter of the promise of the platform, which um, I think has a lot of good aspects to it. 
So um, anyway, thank you, and I hope this um, uh, you know is is uh, informative for for the listeners. Thank you, Gene. Thank you for shedding light on that really important issue of the of the gig economy in this uh, tough time. Um, let's move on to uh, Sharon Burrow, who you will all know is the General Secretary of the International Trade Union Congress. Uh, Sharon, let, let me ask you, um, despite all the hardship brought about by this uh, COVID crisis, uh, there is a sense that the scale of the need and the relief measures we've seen around the world have transformed the public imagination of what's possible. Uh, how can this momentum be built on? What would a global social protection fund look like? So the minister from Pakistan, let me say congratulations, because they've actually put in place the backbone of a social protection system. Now, at the moment, it's focused on, focused on cash transfer, but at some point on income for those who are unemployed or don't have uh, enough income to live on, plus health access are the two key areas we've been promoting as a first step. But a social protection floor covers a range of areas to give people security. What's, what the, the COVID-19 uh, exposed in huge craters, it was there before, and Olivia Destuta knows the history as well as I do, but we got commitment in the UN system to a universal social protection floor 10 years ago. And yet the progress we've seen is so narrow that indeed 55% of, of the world's people have no social protection, no resilience, no foundations for any sense of security. And when you marry that with informal work and you're not making money every day, there's 1.6 billion of our brothers and sisters facing destitution potentially on a daily basis. And then of course, 75% have little or no social protection. So it's an inadequate base of social security. We have to separate, indeed, the classifications of work. But let me say this. If you look at the ILO declaration, we can put a floor of decent work under every worker, irrespective of the, the um, contract, the nature of the employment contract. I have very firm views about technology can't be used for exploitation. And indeed, last uh, session in this discussion, we, Guy Ryder and I pointed out that Indeed, some of the new work looks like work of the, the last century before it was cleaned up with employment regulation. That doesn't mean everybody works in the same way. And technology is changing that, although for the bulk of people, not so much. So what, what do we have to do if we're going to build a just future? We have to have a new social contract that is about recovery and resilience. And of course, jobs are at the centre of that, decent jobs climate friendly jobs if we're going to sustain the planet for future generations, but we must have universal social protection. And if we're going to build that social protection in the poorest countries, then the only way we will uh, enable that to happen is indeed to start by kickstarting those systems with a global social protection fund. And you know, when you think that there's many ways of building up such a fund, but uh, even official ODA going to uh, developed economies, only 0.4% of it goes to social protection. That's not acceptable. And we need to look at the ways through direct funding, through uh, liquidity swaps from special drawing rights, through debt relief and conditionality around SDGs. But if we don't care as a world, about both universal social protection, and that's for everybody, and indeed uh, um, solidarity for the poorest countries, then we are going to see any kind of disaster, climate disaster, pandemics, further pandemics, whatever, knock people out of, uh, again, a, a, a hope of a secure future. So when you know those same people are losing trust in democratic systems, when uh, indeed uh, young people now are saying uh, they won't have pensions, they won't have uh, you know, access to health, then something is very wrong. We are three times richer in just the last 20 years, and yet we have not put affordable systems in place universally around the world, not just in the poor countries, in some of our wealthier countries, but we'll fight those battles. What we have to do is act together for a global social protection fund for the poorest of countries. 
Well, thank you very much. It's a big idea there from Sharon uh, Burrow. Much appreciated. We'll discuss that. But let's move on now to uh, the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty, Olivier de Schutter. Um, so, Olivier, thanks for joining us. H how can we move from the current short-term relief measures around the globe to a comprehensive approach to universal social protection in this uh, new normal? Thank you, Faisal. I think this is indeed um, exactly the right question. As a matter of fact, for the United Nations, um, I recently surveyed the approximately 100, uh, sorry, 1400 social protection measures that were adopted after the COVID-19 crisis in the field of social protection, covering some 200 countries. And what was really impressive was that although that figure seems very high and very encouraging, um, only 600 billion US dollars were committed to social protection during the crisis, which is a very small portion of the $13 trillion that have been injected in the economy by governments in order to stimulate the economic recovery. But more importantly, many of these 1,400 social protection measures were actually leaving many people behind. The findings from the study I made of those measures um, can be summarized as follows. First, many of these measures were temporary stop gaps and were improvised in order to respond to the crisis. In other terms, countries were taken off guard. They were not prepared um, for this. And many of these support schemes, whether in the form of cash transfers to poor households or in the form of um, um, unemployment benefits under temporary unemployment schemes, have been phased out after three or four months. Secondly, many people have been left out. Um, workers from the informal economy, workers in precarious employment positions. Together, these categories represent some 2 billion workers, 61% of the global workforce with weak or no access to social protection. Migrant workers, um, people who um, uh, are just too poor to fill in the forms, um, people who do not have access to documentation, people who cannot fill in um, online um, information because they have no access to internet, um, for example, have been left out from quite a few of these schemes. And the, and the third finding is that very often these uh, schemes that were designed in the midst of the crisis, although of course it's very encouraging to see that governments have reacted, were designed without any participation of the social partners. In fact, the, the ITUC, the International Trade Union Confederation, um, has examined um, some 95 countries um, examining how they adopted social protection schemes and only in 49 of these had unions been consulted. So I think it's very important that we learn the lessons from what happened and what we learn is that we are ill prepared for the next um, economic climatic or indeed sanitary shock and we must build much more robust social protection floors on the basis of a, a rights-based approach as quite um, eloquently described by um, Sanya Nishtar at the start of this panel. What this means, building on the rights-based approach means we have to provide people with entitlements they may claim in order to be um, granted the benefits they have a right to that is empowering to them. It means we have to organize social protection in ways that protects everyone and not selectively or in a way that is only targeting the ultra poor people. And it means that we need to ensure the participation of social partners in the management of social protection schemes. And yes, one important part of what we must do is support low income countries, perhaps developing countries as a whole to um, help them overcome the financing gap today that they uh, experience making it difficult for them to invest in social protection. And quite frankly, this is affordable. The latest study we have on the financing gap shows that to cover all low income countries' um, social protection floors, we would need some 79 billion US dollars per year. That may sound a lot, but it's actually uh, about one half of the total official development assistance already provided by OECD countries, by rich countries, to developing countries. And it's 0.15% of the 
of the gross national income of rich countries. In other terms, it's entirely affordable for us in the OECD countries to provide this encouragement to low-income countries to invest in social protection floors to cover all the population, all women, children, and men throughout their lives um, if we make this a political priority. And, and that shall be indeed, for the next few months, um, my main objective is to convince governments and international agencies to join in this worldwide effort to support poor countries' efforts to, to strengthen social protection floors. Great, thank you very much for that. We'll move on to um, Mike uh, Mansfield from the private sector, from the uh, insurance uh, company Ajon. Uh, Mike is the uh, programme director of the Centre for Longevity and Retirement. Uh, Mike, what is the role of the private sector in this type of uh, world, um, both in terms of what's happened uh, during the pandemic and what might happen and what changes might occur uh, on a long-term basis? Thanks, Faisal, and thanks for the opportunity to speak today. I think we can, we can build on some of the points that have already been made by looking at the private sector as being one of the key partners in the contract that we've created to support social protection for people when they need it during their life and as they, and they move into retirement. I think employers, together with other social partners like governments and individuals, need to work together to develop more sustainable systems um, that rebalance responsibility in a way that everyone has the ability to retire with dignity and that nobody has, no one is left behind. And for the past three years, we've been writing retirement research reports calling for a new social contract, recognizing the fact that our current system is under severe financial strain and responsibility is shifting to the individual. The report we brought out earlier this year is looking at um, what employers can do to create age-friendly workplaces that help people prepare for retirement. And I think there are three areas where the employers and you can think private sector can help in that area. And these are, are a result of the long-term relationship that many people have with their employer. And they offer opportunities for people to prepare for the future and enable them to become more resilient and support our social protection systems for the long-term. And the first area is in providing access to retirement savings arrangements. And here I think the encouraging news is that over half, so 52% of the workers in our survey said that they were offered a retirement plan by their employer. And this creates a great opportunity for workers to save by opening them up to all workers, workers in the gig economy and so forth, and making them portable. When people move jobs, employers can make sure that retirement savings becomes the norm. Employers really have a home game advantage here in that 41% of the workers in our survey said that they started to save for retirement based on a nudge from their employer, employment related reasons. So employers can really play a role in helping people on the journey to saving for retirement. So the second area, I think, in making people more resilient is creating an environment that supports workers in making healthier choices easier and helping them take better care of their health. So even small steps like providing healthy food and snacks in the office were found to have great appeal by almost a third of the workers in our survey. And the third area I think builds on something that we've spoken earlier about, and that's offering opportunities for continual learning and development for people throughout their career. And in an increasingly fast paced world where the job market is becoming increasingly uncertain, Many employers may not be able to guarantee employment for people throughout their careers, but they can help them stay employable, which is why it was disappointing to see that just over one in four workers in the survey said that they didn't receive training to help keep their skills up to date. I think this is a great opportunity for companies to be able to help out, and it's a win-win opportunity. So I think there, there are three areas just cognizant of time. Um, where I think employers in the private sector can help make things more resilient in the future. Great stuff. Uh, thank you very, thank you very much, Mike. Much appreciated. Always got to check whether I'm on mute or not uh, with this. Um, well, that's a great uh, discussion uh, that we had. Um, new insights from uh, emerging economy from the minister uh, about how to create a system of handing out cash to half a country's population. From Jean on the gig uh, economy. The big idea there from Sharon Burrow about the Global Social Protection Fund, uh, a price tag put on something like that from Olivier de Schutter 
of uh, I think $79 billion a year um, uh, and support that will be needed for developing countries. And there, Mike Mansfield telling us about the role of the private sector in trying to manage some of the change of this extraordinary time and trying to create some sort of opportunity for sustainable and sustained change. So thank you very much to everybody that joined us on the live stream.